Hey guys, welcome to the second part of the lecture for today. So, the Olive Branch Petition goes over to England, uh, and in the meantime, things continue to become uh, more and more violent in the colonies. Um, again, we see Boston as sort of the center of this. Uh, the British had sent uh, a large number of troops into Boston in this early part of the war, uh, and colonial militias had dug into defensive positions on the hillsides surrounding the city. So you have British troops inside the city of Boston, the colonial militias are set up on the hills outside of Boston, and the British uh, General Gage, uh, who was in control of Boston at the time, decided uh, that he needed to remove that colonial threat. So he ordered a charge up the hill. This is often called the Battle of Bunker Hill, um, but it actually takes place on Breed's Hill. So if you're reading a more modern historian, they'll likely refer to it as the Battle of Breed's Hill instead of the Battle of Bunker Hill. But Bunker Hill is, of course, the more famous name. So General Gage sends up about 2,200 uh, British troops in three separate charges. Uh, trying to get uh, the colonists off of these hillsides. You can kind of see what this looks like. So the British do win. Uh, they do successfully remove the colonists from these hills. But if you look at this image, you'll notice um, for the British, they're running up this hillside and then they have to get over this little dugout in order to actually get uh, to the colonial militias. So they do win, but it costs them. Uh, the British lose more than a thousand troops. So if you think about there's 2,200 at the start, they lose a thousand. It's This is a close to 50% loss rate, um, which is very devastating for any army. Um, so you have this battle, which is a, technically a British victory, but is very, very costly. In response, uh, the colonial militias that retreat out of this battle, that make it out of this, um, move into upstate New York. Uh, and they find out that there are a large number of cannons at Fort Ticonderoga. Ticonderoga uh, is up in upstate rural New York, a very long way from Boston. Um, but there were about 60 cannons that were in the fort that were very lightly guarded. The British were not expecting the colonists to move that far north. So in the winter of 1775 and 76, the colonial militias successfully take the fort and then they move all of the cannons, all 60 cannons, on sleds, you can see that here, through the icy mountains and into Boston. So this is a, this is quite a, this is kind of one of the great undertakings of the war. Um, moving cannons in a period, oops, without uh, without cars or tanks or something big, um, is difficult in any circumstances. But moving them in the depths of winter over mountains um, is very uh, very unusual and very very difficult. But they do it successfully, uh, and with these cannons, they're able to force the British to give up the city of Boston. So they do, uh, they do eventually win back Boston. Now, by the summer of 1775, word had come back from England. King George sent back uh, and rejected the Olive Branch Petition. He declared that the colonies were an open rebellion, um, and he uh, approved Parliament's outlawing of all exports into the colonies. So at this point, this is kind of the point of no return for the colonists. Uh, they've sent this sort of last ditch, let's make up letter. The king has said no. Um, and Thomas Paine, one of the great leaders of the revolution, uh, writes common sense after this uh, rejection. And in common sense, he argues very persuasively and eloquently uh, that the time has come for revolution, that there is nothing else that can be done to salvage this relationship. The Second Continental Congress agrees with him, and in the summer of 1776, Thomas Jefferson and a small committee uh, of other writers create the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and we can consider this, this is sort of a list of grievances. In this, Jefferson uh, and the other writers list out everything that they're angry about, everything that they're upset about. Um, and it really comes down to the idea that they believed very strongly that they had not consented to the new taxes and that in order for the government to be legitimate that they needed to consent to those taxes uh, and not 
uh, just have them passed uh, however Parliament wanted. So the Declaration of Independence is uh, the real end of the relationship with Great Britain. Um, and after that, the war effort becomes much more intense. So after uh, the Declaration was passed, the British seized the city of New York. Um, and these early battles um, are really difficult for the colonists. Um, many colonists didn't have military experience before the revolution. Uh, certainly they were experienced hunters, they knew how to shoot, uh, but there's a big difference in hunting a deer and uh, participating in armed battle. Uh, the British also have a major, major advantage in that they are able to hire Hessians. Uh, Hessians are German mercenaries uh, that were hired by the English to fight for them. And Hessians in this period are really, really scary. They're sort of seen as the greatest warriors, the greatest armies uh, in the world. Um, so those of you who have read or watched any of the Sleepy Hollow uh, films, or I think there's a TV show now too, um, there's a Hessian uh, that is sort of the, the great villain in those. And it's because Hessians for the time period are absolutely terrifying. They're seen as absolutely savage fighters. And that's who this very inexperienced group of colonial troops led by George Washington are fighting. So there are very few uh, differences, very or not differences, very few victories uh, in this early period. Uh, Americans do win at the battles of Trenton and Princeton, but there's not a lot of territory gained. Um, Trenton and, New and Princeton, both in New Jersey, um, they do, the colonists do win, but they don't really get much out of it. Now, in the late part of 1777, we do have a success at the Battle of Saratoga. And this success is what actually leads the French to begin supporting us. If you think about what we know about France and England, remember France and England have been going to war at this point for hundreds of years. They've gone to war at least four times in the last 150 years. So it makes sense uh, that they would support someone who is interested in fighting the British. So there, uh, there are these few kind of big successes, but the British are also taking large sections of territory throughout 1777. Um, the British win by far many more battles. Um, they seize both New York City and Philadelphia, two of the most major cities in the colonies. Uh, and the winter of 1777 is especially hard uh, for the Americans. Um, the winter of 1777 is very, very cold. Uh, there's an unusual amount of snow and ice, and the American troops winter in Valley Forge, which you can see here. Uh, and about uh, 2,500 of them die during the winter of Valley Forge um, because of the cold and starvation. But there is sort of an upside to this. They spend the winter at Valley Forge training. Uh, and in particular, they're able to recruit a very well-known military officer named Varen von Steuben. Uh, Steuben, S-T-E-U-B-E-N. So Varen von Steuben, a very well-known commander uh, from Prussia, and he helped train the troops. So the American militia that emerges at the end of the winter of 1777 is smaller. They've lost a lot of men due to cold and starvation, but they are stronger. They are better trained, they are more unified, and they are much better able to face the British and uh, the Hessian mercenaries that they had hired. In the South, uh, fighting looks a little bit different uh, throughout this period. Um, so in the North, uh, Washington uh, and his army are sort of taking the brunt of the fighting. In the South, most of the, the colonial fights are led by two individuals. Thomas Sumter, who is nicknamed the Carolina Gamecock, uh, which is a bird, by the way, uh, and also Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. So um, Thomas Sumter and Francis Marion are um, very astute leaders. They recognize that they don't have the numbers to fight in sort of unified lines uh, the way we see Washington and the British doing in the North. Instead, Sumter and Marion both use guerrilla war tactics. 
they hide out in the countryside surrounding southern uh, southern ports and southern cities, and they attack the British, and then they immediately retreat into the woods where it's very difficult for the, the British to find them. So they use these hit and run tactics, uh, which are actually very effective. They're very, very effective. They keep the British uh, from really being able to successfully control the South. Um, now, in response to this, the British um, commander in the South is uh, Benastre Tarleton, and he's often nicknamed Bloody Tarleton. Um, he responded to this kind of behavior by bayonetting any wounded colonist or surrendering colonists, including women and children, uh, which is why he's called Bloody Tarleton. Um, so he is um, he's very, very nasty in his tactics. He responds uh, very, very violently. But he's not able, Vanastri Tollerton, despite the bloodiness and despite the nastiness, is not really able to stop Sumter and Marion from um, moving across the south and uh, taking out um, British, uh, British soldiers. So what happens is that the British uh, eventually kind of get frustrated with Tarleton and they send in a new general. Um, so General Cornwallis, uh, which if you need his name is down here. So General Cornwallis is sent into the south and he is marched um, in, he marches into uh, Virginia. And what happens is that the Americans get word of this. They know that he's coming. Uh, they know the countryside better than the British do. And so Sumter and Marion sort of keep him busy in Virginia uh, for, during the time it takes General Washington to march south. They trap Cornwallis on a narrow peninsula, and he really has no choice. He's got Marion and, Game, and Thomas Sumter uh, on one side. He's got Washington on the other. There is nowhere to go but the ocean, and the ocean... Uh, is filled with French ships. So he's basically surrounded on all sides. Uh, and so he is forced to surrender, um, which you can see here. There's kind of a funny story about all of this. Um, so Cornwallis absolutely hated having to surrender to Washington. He um, was humiliated. And so he decided to send, instead of going himself, giving Washington the honor of surrendering himself, he sent over his second in command. Well, Washington heard about this, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but he heard about this through their network of spies. And so Washington also sent his second in command. Um, so it's sort of a sort of a funny, he, you know, Cornwallis just thought it would be terribly humiliating to have to surrender to Washington. So, um, when we look at this, when we look at the revolution, um, the image that springs to mind is probably something that looks like the painting that's on your screen. This is one of the most famous images uh, that is painted about the revolution, Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, but the painter that made this wasn't actually born until 1816. So he wasn't actually born until 1816. By, by the time the painter who painted this is born, we know that we won and that we're successful. We beat the British again in the War of 1812. We're already an established nation. But it's important to understand, when Cornwallis surrenders and the war ends in our favor, it ends um, in a much more ambiguous way than we know, uh, we know today. Uh, Washington lost more battles than he won. Uh, we won basically because the British commanders were incompetent. Um, because Cornwallis and Tarleton and Gage made stupid decisions. They did stupid things. They lost lives that they didn't need to lose because they were overconfident. We win because they suck. We don't win because we're great. Um, and we also forget to think about the number of people who didn't support the revolution. There were many Americans who stayed loyal to Great Britain. They're called loyalists. Um, and Americans as a whole, even those that uh, support the revolution, are very, very British in terms of culture, in terms of language, in terms of understanding. So this revolution, uh, we sort of have a modern understanding of how it works, but they did not necessarily have it. To give you an idea of how this looks, uh, at the time of the revolution, John Adams, the great leader uh, in Massachusetts, believed that only about a third of Americans actually supported the war. 
So this is something we have to think about. We know how it ends. Uh, they didn't necessarily know that Great Britain wasn't just going to come and take them back. 